So I'm going to introduce two of our speakers today uh, who are going to present on uh, midwifery-led care during labor and birth. And I'm excited about these topics. So we have uh, two of our presenters. We have Liz Salet, is a midwife, who works as a scientific worker for Flemish midwives, where she's uh, responsible for annual reports of uh, midwifery-led care in Belgium. She, compi she combines this with employment uh, with uh, work as study coordinator at the University Hospital in Brussels and General Hospital at uh, Cottridge. Uh, she's also part of the team concerning scientific research in um, Flemish midwives. Then we have Elke. Elke is a passionate first line midwife and lactation expert in Brussels. She's the founder of midwifery practice um, in Brussels. She's part of the team concerning autonomous midwifery in Belgium, uh, in Flemish midwives. So welcome, both of you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hello. Um, thank you, Eunice, for this introduction. Um, can you give us uh, the rights to switch the slides? Okay, uh, so we will talk about uh, metrophilate care during labor and birth in Belgium. Uh, we will talk about the actual status of us working as a midwife in Belgium because it's not that easy and we will go into our numbers from uh, the year 2021. So I'm Lise Lott, this is Elke, we were already introduced. So the situation in Belgium and also why this report, because it's not easy working as a midwife in Belgium. I don't know if that is the same uh, for you in your country, but um, the standard here in Belgium is if you are pregnant, mostly you will have a hospitalized birth in the hospital with your doctor. You can see in our statistics, more than 99% of the wo women will have a hospitalized birth and the midwifery led care is just a small part of it. Um, so we have a high medicalization of care. We have lots of inductions, episiotomies, epidurals. Um, but there are a lot of passionate midwives who are working in Belgium and their work is not that um, known in Belgium. So that's something that we want to change. Uh, we also want to change the culture of um, some people that are saying and thinking that midwifery care is dangerous. Um, so that's another reason. And there is also no exact knowledge of how many midwives are now guiding women during labor and uh, birth. So that's quite a mystery for us. So there are a lot of reasons why we are doing this. Um, it's our second report. Uh, for the methodology, we used a registration form from each for each birth. Um, we focused mostly on low risk pregnancies, which we mean um, labors that can start in the first line with a midwife. And that are planned to uh, give birth with a midwife. That can be at home in a birthing house, um, in or outside the hospital, or the midwife can go uh, to the hospital and using the labor work to guide her woman to her labor and birth. Mostly of our registrations are from the Flemish and uh, part of the, of the country and Brussels. So you can see on the map the green and the orange parts. Um, Belgium is really quite a difficult country. We speak a lot of languages. Um, and from the French part, Wallonia, we have a little bit uh, starting midwives who are started with registrations, but it's still also a mystery how many midwives we are missing. But from the Flemish part and Brussels, we can be sure we have more than 98% uh, of, the, of the midwives that are working and guiding women during labor and birth are registration uh, of do, are doing their registration with us. 
then if we give you an overview for numbers we had in 2021 1587 registration with uh, the french parts included um so that were all um, labors that were planned to give birth with the midwife and um, from them we had 1311 midwifery led births um, mostly outside the hospital a lot of women uh, of women prefer to give birth at home um, slightly at 20 percent were in a birth center and one on the go there were also uh, births inside the hospital we have one uh, midwifery led unit in belgium one i mean one in a hospital in other countries i think it's more midwifery led units in a hospital we have just one in brussels but they are really doing a lot of work and then we have um, the births where the, the midwife goes to the hospital and um, uses the labor ward of the hospital there were also um, a few women that needed to be transferred during uh, labor and we will go into that in the da detail later. Um, so, thank you, Lisa Lott. Um, so, we are going to talk about the difference, differences between midwives guiding a, a woman during labor and birth inside versus outside the hospital. Um, and we start um, with fetal monitor, so it will be a lot of data that I'm going to tell you. Um, uh, the fetal monitor outside the hospital, mostly we use intermittent auscultation, like 97%, uh, so the uh, biggest part. And in the hospital we see that there is uh, more use of um, CTG. Um, for the outside um, hospital deliveries, we think that it's important um, in promoting the mobility for pregnant women, um, and that's why um, we promote that too. You see also that um, outside the hospital, uh, 3% um, didn't have any uh, fetal monitoring, so that's what we think uh, or we call the speedies. Um, they delivered very fast, and in the hospital, you see also more continuous uh, CTG, 6%. Um, and if we go um, through the ruptures of the membranes, um, we see in the hospital, uh, or we see a difference of 5%. So there is more spontaneous rupture of the membranes outside the hospital um, than inside the hospital. And um, what is also a difference is that you see that 1% of the babies are born in the amniotic sac. So in Belgium, we call them um, born with a helmet and we uh, say always that that are lucky babies. So there are more um, intact amniotic sacs outside the hospital than inside the hospital. Um, Um, and then we go um, through the birth positions. You, so you see that it's a bit the same inside and outside the hospital that the majority um, of the women choose for an upright birthing position. Um, um, around 40% um, choose for uh, the hands and knees position um, inside and outside the hospital. Um, and also you see the same amount, 43% of the women had a water birth and that's water birth in the different positions. Um, what is the difference inside the hospital? You see more um, supine, uh, supine positions or more lying down positions. Um, to get noise. Good. And then um, about the perineum, uh, we are proud to announce that 97% of the birds um, were with an intact or mild perineum rupture. So that's uh, very nice. Um, and only 1% had an episiotomy in outside the hospital and also inside the hospital. Um, and also we didn't have had a lot of severe ruptures uh, around one in between one and two percent for uh, inside and outside hospitals. Um, okay. And then for the repair of the perineal lacerations, 60% uh, um, outside the hospital didn't need any stitches. Um, 
uh, versus inside hospital 42 percent um, and most of the women were um, search searched by midwives um, inside and outside the hospital um, and then the placenta um, so you see that's also a bit the same um, so uh, you have percent had a spontaneous birth of the placenta means no use of medication outside the hospital and there were 14 percent less spontaneous births of the placenta inside the hospital and um, six percent uh, active policy um, outside the hospital that means that there was use of oxytocin so use of medication um, and there were 15 percent of active uh, management of uh, the placental phase inside the hospital um, so there is a link with I know, yeah with the link with blood loss um, uh, in the direct postpartum so um, from home so the ma majority had an estimated blood loss of less than 500 milliliters um, and inside the hospital um, no, uh, sorry, outside the hospital, 3% we had to refer to the hospital for problems in the postpartum period. Um, instead of 6% uh, from the hospital, we have to transfer them to a special uh, ward for placenta retention or mostly for uh, bleeding. Um, and the bleeding then more than 500 milliliters. Um, so, and then uh, we have the GBS. So in Belgium, it's common to check the GBS, um, and we see that 11% of the women with a positive or an unknown GBS swab uh, received antibiotics. That so that was not a lot. And inside of the hospital, it was 55%. Um, so uh, we know that it's due to the hospital protocol. So if they are positive, uh, they are more forced to um, take antibiotics. Um, also, 89% didn't not receive antibiotics, but there were no neonatal infections um, that we can uh, that we have in our data. Um, okay, it's most important. Thing. And then we have the neonatal data. Um, so uh, you see that um, outside the hospital. Outside the hospital, so for home births, we had less girls, 49% and 51% inside the hospital. We don't know why, but there is a little difference. That's a funny fact. And also that um, in the hospital, uh, outside the ho hospital, babies are 100 grams uh, bigger than inside the hospital. Also a funny fact, <laughs> because last year it was the same. Um, and how babies react after their birth, we saw that it was after one minute and five minutes um, very good um, APGAR scores, um, so more than seven, um, also uh, inside the hospital. Um, and it, there were 4% uh, uh, neonates uh, or babies that had to go um, to the neonat neonatology for reanimation and 3% inside the hospital. So here you can see an overview of the data um, for the comparison between outside and inside for fetal monitoring. Uh, we are happy to see that most is intermittent auscultation. But you see inside the hospital when a CTG is all available, it's also more used. Um, for the rupture of membranes, we have quite similar um, results. For the bird position, uh, we see in both settings that uh, women could choose a lot of positions. Um, they preferred on hands and knees, so um, outside and inside the hospital. But inside the hospital, we see slightly more uh, supine positions. Then uh, for the perineum, we have really good um, numbers here mild perineum rupture or an intact perineum yes for the placenta we see a more difference but it's like what Elke said um it's like that the some hospitals are um yeah 
they make it available to use the labor ward as a midwife, but then you have to follow their protocols. And in a lot of hospitals, it is um, after the birth, you have to give the woman directly uh, medication like oxytocin. Um, and that's why you see here uh, the difference. It's like the same with the GBS. Um, in a lot of hospitals, it's like the protocol you have to give uh, a woman antibiotics intrapartum if she has a positive or unknown GBS swap. For the APCARs, we have in both groups really good um, APCAR scores. Like I said, there were also um, transfers um, intrapartum, like 17%. Why? Uh, mostly for uh, stagnation. 27% um, of the women had to be transferred for no progression and dilatation. Um, we had also a lot of referrals due to other reasons like the need for pain relief. Um, and we are happy to see that uh, the referral due to urgency are um, quite uh, not that much, just 7%. Uh, um, so most pr uh, referrals were due to no progression and dilatation or the need for pain relief. If we then make a um, comparison between the multi and the primi para, we see a really big difference. Um, if there was a transfer needed and it was 72% with the primi para against just 28% multi para. Um, but the reasons why are the same. Um, but here also for stagnation of labor, um, the difference between pre preemie and multipara are um, quite a lot. For urgency, they are um, the same, just low person, uh, percents that we are happy to see that these are low. And for the other reasons like need for pain relief, we see also a big difference. Then how was the delivery after a transfer? Uh, more than half of the women had a spontaneous delivery. Um, a quarter of the women had an instrumental delivery with the Fontouze or four ships, and 14% had a C-section. Um, almost half of the women did ask for an epidural anesthesia after transfer, and a quarter of the women did receive an episiotomy. So here um, it's difficult to say, it's really easy to say, um, yeah, in the hospital we see more medicalization. Um, but after transfer, do we still speak about a low risk pregnancy? Not in every case. Um, so it's normal to see more uh, medicalization. But um, if you would look at normal uh, birthing process in a hospital of a low risk woman, you would also see more continuous use of CTG, uh, more uh, use of spine position, um, an active policy for uh, the birth of the placenta. So it's, um, yeah, quite double here to say. Then um, the neonatal data, um, we have slightly more girls. Um, the mean birth weight is quite the same as in uh, like the midwifery led births, uh, around 3.5 kilograms. And the APCAR scores here are um, also really good after one and five minutes. And uh, just 7% of the neonates required reanimation. So um, who is now a typical woman that chose to have her delivery with her midwife? We see mostly multipara women. Why is that? Um, yeah, we have mainly two reasons. Um, we have uh, women that are afraid for uh, the previous birth with the midwife for the first child because yeah, in our society, it's like the culture you ha go to the hospital to have your um, birth in the hospital with a doctor. So it's quite alternative to do it with a midwife, but we also see uh, a lot of women that are not happy or tra traumata traumatized um, by their previous birth and want to have another experience for the next child or the next children. For the mean age, we see um, 33 years old and uh, the preference goes to a home birth. 
Then the typical uh, bird here for fetal monitoring, um, it's intermittent auscultation with Doppler. The previous, the, the bird position that is most preferred is on hands and knees. Um, placental phase, we have blood loss less than 500 milliliters with spontaneous birth of the placenta. We have good APGAR scores for more of seven um, after one and five minutes. The mean birth weight will be around 3.5 kilograms and if the transfer needed, it will be mostly with para for stagnation or the need for pain relief. Okay, um, this is uh, one of the last slides. So the project, project Open Hospital. So uh, as we told, in Belgium is not so easy as a midwife to do births. Um, uh, or birds themselves, uh, midwives, there are different reasons. The culture, culture for women uh, to deliver with the midwife, but also the culture um, for the midwives, because they are um, often the assistant of the gynecologist. And also there are not a lot of possibilities to do birds in uh, there is a uh, few bird centers and there is uh, recently one ward closed last year and um, that's the reason that we start a an working group of volunteers midwives to make a document open hospitals um, and we did that to empower midwives and to discuss um, with hospitals um, to open their ward to have the possibilities to do uh, birds. Yesterday, yesterday, I discussed that in the center of Brussels um, with uh, one of the hospitals. Um, uh, I hope they will give us a go, um, but that's not sure yet. Um, and just to say that we uh, do all this for women and also um, we like to wake up the government um, to, to tell them to see that it's very important to have women-centered care. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because we believe that each woman um, should have where to give birth and with who as a caregiver. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. Here you can see also our poster about the animal report. And you can find everything on um, this site um, where you can find the poster in different um, formats. formats. And languages too, I think. And languages too. So um, thank you very much for listening. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Lisolet and Elke, for the nice presentation um, on midwifery-led care during labor and birth. And I think that's quite inspiring. So feel free to, for the, for the viewers, kindly feel free to ask questions, you may unmute yourself and ask um, verbally, or you may type your questions in the chat box. I can see one question for you, Alisa yes. uh, um So yeah. the question is, what are the responsibilities of the midwives after transfer? So it's really diverse for each hospital. In some hospitals, they close the door. You cannot go with your woman. In other hospitals, you can go as doula, but not as midwife. And other hospitals, they let you go as midwife. So it's quite different for um, each hospital and also for um, the midwives that working in the hospital. Sometimes you have a really good um, connection with them or just not. Um, so it depends. But if you transfer to the hospital, then um, it's the doctor that is responsible on that moment. So if you um, as midwife decide that it's too risky to do a home birth or to the, to have a midwife birth in the hospital and you transfer, then you're not responsible anymore. I think also that was a yeah. the question maybe. Okay. Um, so maybe a question um, for you all. Um, how is the situation in your country for the midwives? Is it easy to work or do you experience also like a cultural yeah, difference or is it seen like something alternative or something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good, good question. Uh, maybe I'll take it first. Uh, for Kenya, given that uh, I'm a midwife in Kenya, although um, mostly um, teaching, in Kenya we actually don't have midwifery-led care, like outside the hospital setting. 
generally um, so most of the births take place within the hospital um, the home births um, are very few and it hasn't been embraced within the country that uh, you can have home births so that's something i would like to maybe for you to share the lessons from, from um, your country how did you achieve this maybe from the history that you, you were able to have midwifery led uh, care within the country because like today we had international day of the midwife celebrations and that's one of the, our asks that we want to be you know allowed to have midwifery led care outside the hospital but then of course they are talking about infrastructural challenges so maybe share with us also how did you go about it to have it more you know strengthened within your country thank you um I also see a question um, for Celine. Uh, midwives are part of the public healthcare system, but um, their payment is quite low. Um, so you have the convention where the midwives ask um, like an uh, amount that is set, but for some midwives it's really, really low to survive at the end of the month. So they have choose to deconvent and to ask more. Um, and for the reimbursement, it's quite lower, so the patient had to pay a little bit more, but it's still not that much, but um, it's part of public care. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Aisha that it would be more cost effective. Um, we have tried to uh, do some research for that in Belgium, but they didn't accept it. Hmm. Um, so we will keep trying. <laughs> Okay, uh, maybe uh, another question about uh, the midwifery led care model that you have. Uh, what are the types maybe in your country that you have embraced? For example, do you have like midwifery led uh, care uh, facilities which are alongside like in the hospital, but then there's typically one unit which is midwifery led care and then another one obstetric led care or um, maybe you have another one which is standalone midwifery led care outside the hospital but in their own setting or maybe so what kind of um, midwifery led care do you have in your country you are muted for us uh -huh. um so mostly it is just one type of care and that's just the labor ward care there is only one hospital where they make a difference so you have the midwifery unit in hospital and you have to you have the labor ward and those are um yeah not uh, they're not uh, uh, they are separated yeah. from <laughs> each other but then the only settings you have are birth centers outside of a hospital and the home birds and the home birds and in mm. some cases a midwife can go to a hospital to use the labor wards but it's only hospitals that are open for that so as a midwife it's really difficult for working but also i'm pregnant now and i had the opportunity just to have uh, with one midwife association to have my home birth because it's too far for other midwives and that's really sad if you want to have a home birth in belgium okay. and there is a question sabrina so most uh, women received prenatal preparation they have all prenatal um, follow-up but mostly with a gynecologist and that's um, more uh, medical checkups and they have uh, not a lot of um, preparation prenatal preparation so midwives um, take care um, of uh, to, to prepare them, them for uh, labor and uh, um, and they're Midwives are also giving uh, courses in group, but not for everyone uh, for the moment. Okay, uh, that's a good uh, actually question. Uh, I'm just thinking about um, psychoprophylaxis, like preparation in case of um, 
maybe an emergency alternative maybe what considerations do you usually have for women to choose that this woman i can take care of them within a home setting and this one i need to refer maybe just a quick one for those people like for us who are still thinking of uh, you know who are still advocating for this so before we start maybe what are some of the considerations you would uh, maybe share with us um so for um i worked before um as a midwife in bristol and if we have home births we can go to the hospital so we had a referral hospital so um, most of the time if it's urgent we go with ambulance or uh, by car um and we are welcome in uh, one hospital um so to work it's nice uh, to work together with them um, and that's also the hospital that I asked to have a midwifery that care um, yesterday oh, okay thank you thank you so much